much. Happy to be here in Berlin, this beautiful city. It was a very pleasant city. And to be again among people, that's already something nice uh, after COVID, or is it still COVID? What I did prepare for, the, for today, I thought maybe take you with me a little bit in, in journey in my life, how I became an architect, than just showing buildings. Is that a good idea? And why I make the people place purpose uh, philosophy. So uh, just to tell you, I'm number four of five kids. What gave me a very, uh, gave me a lot of freedom, I can tell you. But also, uh, I have three brothers and one sister. And also, you know, I was, this is the Netherlands, and I was born in the very south of the Netherlands, where you still have hills, soft hills, and what is not Calvinistic. So I'm, um, but now I day, so that's the picture above, that's the, the landscape where I have lived until I was eight years old. And I've been moving with my parents even to the north of Groningen. And, uh, but nowadays I live in Rotterdam, and that's why I call it the Dutch mountains. There in, in the flat landscape, the buildings are the mountains, but I came from the soft hills of uh, the southern part of the Netherlands. And people sometimes say to me, Francine, you always want to make soft hills everywhere in the world. And maybe that's true, because I come from this part of the Netherlands. For me, the office is based in Delft. And uh, for me, the Technical University of Delft has always been extremely important. I started to study there in 1974. Um, and we started the office by winning a competition in 1980. So I'm what at that time we would call it now a startup from the university. But that's, you didn't call it that time like this. But Delft has always been extremely important for me also working together because the future always have been about being collaborative between all, all other disciplines of the university. And, and that's what we did and also where we did our library and um, the campus plan. Because you have to realize, I started in, as I told you, in 1974, the university, that campus was more like that. So you, you really, uh, because I'm now working for like 40 years, so you have different zeitgeist during your life. So uh, we started as, this, as, as students there, and we won with the three of us a competition for, at that time there were no competitions and we won it and we were still students. And we were even were allowed to build it. So after finishing, uh, finishing that project, I finished school. So I did really the project when doing being a, a student. Um, who has been important in my life is, for instance, Charles and Ray Eames, who I did know through Max Rissalada. I don't know if you know Max Rissalada, but he was an important teacher at the Technical University in Delft. And he used to work there. And he said when we were traveling to California, he said, you should meet Charles and Ray Eames. So we went there. We met uh, uh, Ray in 1978. And we kept on. She did, passed away in 1988. So we went, every time we went to the United States, we always went to uh, Ray Eames. And, now had celebrations, etc. Another thing that was extremely important in my life was um, urban renewal. You know, I was a student in the 70s. That was really the time of urban regeneration. Talking to everybody, um, all imagine, I don't know how Berlin looked at that time, but you know, all cities in the whole world were, were totally different than now. And people say nowadays that, oh, you have to talk to people. You know, I always did talk to people because that was part of urban regeneration, talking to the people, uh, making affordable housing, uh, change neighborhoods that were often very, very bad in a bad situation. So I has always been very much connected to urban regeneration, but also the politicians who had to deal with that and to help them to realize their dreams. Another thing what was important in my life that in 1985 I did get a stipendium to travel to Japan, a travel stipendium, and I went there for four months. And it was for me very important to get some freedom, you know, in thinking because to Japan, nobody went to Japan at that time. But also where I met Toyo Ito, and here is a funny picture because I'm here with Kasuya Seishima on the same picture in the train. And uh, of course we're still in contact with each other, but she was at that time totally not famous yet. Um, another person that was important for me was Alvaro Siza. We, we became his local architect when he was doing this project in The Hague. And for me, you have to realize, I came from the Technical University in Delft, what is rather rational. You, know, had to do, you, know, had to, you had to design also a lot of housing, of course, at that time, in a very structured way. 
but he gave me the freedom that you could think in a more sculptural way. So for me, he was very important. Also, he was not famous at that time. He was also always working in our office, having dinner at, at our home. At, uh, but to think in a more sculptural way, way was for me giving my head more freedom in my own thinking. Another thing what was important was in 2000 was the um, Architecture Biennale in Sao Paulo, where they made um, at the Dutch uh, entrance was uh, the work of Herr Hetzberger, Herman Hetzberger, Aldo van Eyck and Meccano, the three humanist architects from the Netherlands. Um, it was very interesting to be combined in, in one uh, exhibition. It was done by Max Rieselada to make the exhibition. I spent that like two weeks even writing all the text myself um, by hand and making it blue and uh, using the bamboo. But also being for two weeks in, in this building where the exhibition was uh, the, the, uh, from, um, in, in the, from uh, Niemeyer and in Park Iberapera gave me an enormous inspiration of the sculpturality, but also thinking about what is the value of parks. Um, and I also learned there, that period, the work of um, Lina Bobardi, what was, uh, she was not alive anymore at that time, but to be inspired by local people and doing your architecture there, it was for me like almost coming home. So I also felt very much uh, linked uh, to her work. And of course, it's also very much linked to the work of Aldo van Eyck. Um, I've always, always been writing or making books. Uh, one of the first one was uh, composition, contrast and complexity. I also learned that you should not make difficult uh, titles of a book, <laughs> so we call it just CCC. But for me, it was essential. I did write it down to write down my own thinking, but also what I wanted to do because our work was for Meccano. I wanted to write it for my own staff, because you know normally for architects it was like oh you make always like Richard Meyer you make white buildings or you are you know or you make everything square or rectangular or you know that it was a design and a formal language. But I didn't have the formal language, I had a, an attitude. So I made 10, um, what I call the 10 statements, what all the Meccanos had to know, people working, and we call it the Meccanos, eh? people working in the office. So they know the philosophy of the office and uh, how to deal with that. Because I said, we, we have the symphony orchestra. At this moment, we have about 130 people, and we really try to combine architecture, renovation, landscaping, interior, uh, to bring it all together with different skills of different people. And depending on the project we take, we, we put, I take the right people to make the nice harmonious uh, music with them. Um, the other book was the, what I call Dutch Mountains, uh, because I realized that for me, the soil is extremely important, how you connect to the soil. And for me, for instance, the trees, it's for me totally different if I do something in Taiwan or in, um, or in, 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 in the south of the Netherlands or in Rotterdam or in New York or Boston or Washington, what are totally different cities and even different climates. And for me also the soil, the earth says something about, uh, and the trees that grow there say something about the culture. Because in a way, the culture makes the people. So it's for me, yeah, maybe it's a little bit difficult how I explain it, but you know, these Dutch mountains was very much how you, I don't know the English word, but you call it in, in, in the Netherlands, Aarden, that something earth, you know, it's something is rooted. And that was for me very much part of uh, the philosophy of Meccano. Um, and then I made people place purpose, because that was the philosophy that, you know, I was working maybe for 30 years at that time, and I learned in school very much, everything was very much purpose-driven. You know, you have to make so much square meters and this height and, and these functions. But I learned in these 30 years, the functions always changes. Why should I so much be purpose-driven? Uh, it's for me much more about the place, uh, as I told you in the Dutch mountains, to, to uh, yeah, what, 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 what is the place, what is the culture, what is the earth, what is the climate? And then at the end, it's about people. Um, because also people ask me, how can you design so many different buildings all over the world? But in a way, all these people have rather similar values. You know, it's about the senses, hearing, touching, feeling, seeing. Um, but also that people want, uh, 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 from which country you are, you want to take care of your children or about the elderly, or you want 
to be healthy. So this thing of what is people minded, human minded is all over the world kind of the same. So I would say people place purpose also in that order. And the next book we will add, we will make an update of that, this book. I, I will add poetry to it. Because people say also the things you make are also very poetic. And I agree, yes, to have some poetry in your work uh, the, uh, is extremely uh, important. So after COVID, we will do the P, 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 P. Yeah, <laughs> we add the poetry to it. Um, another thing what was important, and tell me when I have to stop. Yeah? Uh, but uh, another thing was was important for in my life is working with the theater world. Uh, I think around the year 2000 or something like that, I started to get connected to the theater world and often the avant-garde theater world. And that also meant no having no money, yeah? like affordable housing, but avant-garde theaters are having no money. But for me, it was very interesting how to observe their values. You know, it's not about expensive materials. It's much, very much about daylight or dealing with um, artificial light and with color. So the first work I made, this was the very first theater, was in an old church at uh, the building that was the, the old church. We made a theater out of it. And I was very much dealing with lights and uh, artificial lights and using um, uh, also paint that came from the theater world, not from the building industry. So I really started to, wor and to work with curtains and often how can I get effect uh, with little money. And they kept me, the theater world kept me always inspired because it's almost like stage setting. Of course, the library in Delft, what we did, what is like a landscape and a building uh, and the cone as a symbol of the beautiful beauty of a technical form, have a technical university. But also, if you look at the interior, the blue is the blue, is the, is the um, we, the, we call it Meccano blue, but it's the blue from the stage world or to use also, because you have to realize at that time, a lot of things were just uh, minimalistic, gray, everything was gray, etc. But I like colors, I like expressionism. And especially also, you know, all these buildings we did for school budgets, was not high budgets, it was very, really, so the, here the blue, or the chapel I made in uh, Rotterdam, but it's, I think maybe our very smallest projects, but maybe the most poetic and beautiful one, um, in, uh, in Rotterdam with dealing with the light from the earth and the light from heaven and how the sequence is, it's on a cemetery uh, in it. I started in, I think just before 2000, I started to research mobility as part of daily life because I felt that architects, and I'm also an urbanist, was dealing with mobility, was just talking about um, asphalt and railroad tracks or you know you were you did drive a car but you didn't sit in a train but you know it was so strange for me it was not from the perspective of a human being so I started to become uh, by my own to do research on it then I also became a professor in the aesthetics of mobility <laughs> with my own chair at the Technical University in Delft and then they asked me to do to run the architecture biennale in Rotterdam was extremely interesting. I think I'm almost most proud of that project I did in my life. I don't think everybody knows that, but okay. It's because I did in two years time uh, um, worldwide uh, research on mobility as part of the, yeah, looking in an other way of thinking to mobility. And I remember doing that whole research. People asked me, okay, what was your conclusion at the end? Yeah, because there was exhibition, there was a book, there was movies, there was on the television. Um, um, and I said, it's the bike, the future will be the bike. And people were amazed, well, how can she have such a stupid conclusion? Is it true that it came out? It's the bike, it's the future. What I was extremely happy because I did so much research on mobility was winning in, I don't know which year, 2006, I believe, the um, competition for the railroad station in our own city of Delft. With, with on top of it the city hall. It was for me really a um, crown on all the work I did on uh, mobility. And it's still a very nice station. What I have also have been doing for many, many years, I think seven years it says here, seven years, uh, I was writing columns in the financial newspaper in uh, the Netherlands. And it was interesting because I had to do it every six weeks in column. It was always a lot of work. 
but it, you have you you have you are you have to write down your ideas and what you see what's happening in society and how you comment on it and i would like even i never did it publish them because it's extremely interesting i don't do it anymore because at a certain moment in the that uh, they, the, the newspaper did get an other owner, so um, that he selected other people to do it. But I think it was, like, for me, very important to do this. And it's also interesting because you can follow the zeitgeist, what is happening at those times. Another thing what was interesting, as I told you, for me, being a kid of the Technical University in Delft, uh, studying architecture, I was always very much linking to the other disciplines. For instance, I don't know you know Wibble Ockels, but that was the, the guy from the Netherlands who went to the moon. Uh, uh, so he was also from Technical University in Delft. So I was also working a lot together with him and with people in my, the young people in my office. It was very inspirational to work with non-architects. That's People ask me where your inspiration is. Most of the time it's non-architects <laughs> because it brings another value to it. So to b think in the innovative way and sustainability came very much of people flying to the moon because they see how um, vulnerable the earth is. He passed away some years ago. Now it brings me to the US. Um, as I told you, did I tell you? But like in 1976, I think, I went for the very first time all alone to the US by the Greyhound bus. All these cities were extremely dangerous. But the funny thing, I went to New York, I went to Washington, I went to Boston, and I went to Toronto and Montreal because it was the year of the bicentennial and the Olympics in Canada. And I traveled for uh, three euro. That was my budget, maybe um, three euros a day or something like that. And um, the funny thing is I'm now working in all these cities that I've seen at that trip. For instance, this is Boston. Um, urban regeneration. You know, this was something for me. And they were asked us, and we won a competition to um, put the municipal offices um, uh, on this plot. And dealing uh, to observe the people, what is needed. A lot of Afro-American people living there, a lot of women, because often the men were in jail. So it's, it was a very, um, you know, and, and to think of what, what would be needed to help this neighborhood in a better world. And also bringing like the, what I call the Boston bricks with a Dutch touch, because Boston is also very much a brick city. Like in my country, we don't have materials, we don't have ceramics, <laughs> we only have clay, and from clay you make bricks. So we made this beautiful project, I think, with the partly some buildings we had to keep, what I call the, the sculpturality of the bricks, but also I used a very hard brick that reflects the light in a beautiful way with a beautiful um, craftsmanship, what we learned them, the people in Boston, how to do it. And they are and people really love in the whole neighborhood still this building because it so gives so much energy. But also gives from the inside, not... I start to hate to all these glass buildings, can I say so? Because it gives you much more rhythm, eh? it, it makes the buildings much more jazzy and how you get beautiful um, shadows inside and, and to the outside. Another, I, th I think this is a little movie. I don't know how to start this. It was, of course, Birmingham for me. I think it's a movie. Is it, can you check that? I don't know any. If I just do this? Oh, it starts. Birmingham is very much inspired by the city itself. A city with many identities. A city with a very proud history of as an industrial city that went down. But it's also the city of um, jewelry. So I really wanted to make a building that, uh, and it's the biggest library of, um, of, the, of Europe, to give something not minimalistic, not a glassy building, but that was inspired by the city itself, the whole aesthetics. Um, but also a journey of learning through it. And also in the, in the library, it's, um, the higher you go up, you go through the collection. I wanted to show, they have an amazing collection in Birmingham, also about um, Shakespeare, for instance. And the higher you go up, it gets more to research. And to make a publicly, as also they have an exhibition, a museum in the building. But to this whole journey to go through the building, I think is amazing. And here on top is the Shakespeare Memorial Room. 
and that people can go for free, go to uh, the roof and oversee their own city. It makes everybody so happy and that's something we also did here, here, here in Birmingham, but also you see later in New York and in Washington. Designing the gardens for the census, creating little hills, um, and make space for um, a public building needs public space. So always the thinking inside, outside, landscape, interior, architecture is very much Meccano. And we are on a stamp. I also did. I, I, I just don't like the picture, to be honest. I would always, but it's nice that we are on a stamp. Just I do. I have still. I still have Washington, and New York. Is that okay? Washington is maybe my most emotional project. I have to tell you, it's a building. I think there's a little. Is this a movie or not? It's it's a building of Mies van der Rohe in Washington, named after Martin Luther King. But it was never designed for him. It was opened in 1972. Uh, Mies was dead, and of course Martin Luther King uh, uh, was murdered. And inside the whole building, this is the original pictures, was full of homeless people sitting in the Barcelona chairs. And I said, what to do? And it was, and to be honest, horrible, the building from inside. And people hated the building. And I thought, okay, I have Mies, I have Martin Luther King, and I have to make the library of the future, how to deal with this. And uh, we made a documentary, if you ever have the time of it, I'm not sure if it's in here, but it's called uh, A Legacy of Mies and King. But if you have ever the time, it's a documentary of one hour. They follow me on, you know, how can I balance this, these two personalities? Uh, and I decided at the end that, of course, I want to honor Mies. And I want to honor Martin Luther King. But at the end, for me, Martin Luther King is much more important than Mies. So, um, and so this whole research, how to do this, I think it's very well explained, or this following my research in this build. And now the building is finished. We could not make a movie of the, because of COVID, of the, now the building is finished, but it's extremely um, popular and really beautiful. Here's some images, what we did to it, to make it more transparent, to make it, give it a human touch, or I even said a, a, a female touch to it, making new stairs in it, make the great hall not like so impressive that if small kids come inside, they, that they think, hey, is this building meant for me, you know? Uh, to, not to impress people, but to, to let people feel welcoming. That's extremely important. Here the new stairs that we made into it, like social stairs, um, and that you can go down and you can go up the light from the heaven. Uh, and even we made a slide in it. Can you imagine in a building of Mies van der Rohe a slide? And also to make a great uh, reading room, because New York has a, the Rose Main reading room, Boston has a beautiful reading room, so we took one floor out and we made a double height space with a more serious reading room in it with a, a beautiful ceiling. And here, how, what we did on the roof. I learned in the US that all the roofs, I don't know, I, I don't think it's here in Berlin, is used for mechanical penthouses, mechanical equipment. And, but it's the most beautiful spot. So we made a whole park of it and made a pavilion on top of it, set back so that people don't see it from the outside, that it still looks very measy in the building. But it's really nice. And it brought me to New York, uh, to maybe the most famous library in the world, the New York Public Library. Uh, but it's part of a whole midtown campus renovation. It's not just this building, but also it brought me that I could live in New York, what I really did like. Um, a city that gives me so much energy uh, with the amazing view and the lights and it's so inclusive. It gives you so much inspiration. Uh, and also, if you look very well to it, it's there. This is the New York Public Library, but it's also the building across. I don't know if you can see it with the wizard hat. Um, because it's combining, as a mid Manhattan campus plan, is it's two buildings and even Bryant Park, and bring them together. Because the one is a research library. Every library is different. This is one is the research library, the two with the two lines, and the other one is the circulating library, the biggest one of New York and how to bring that together in a logic way. And it's partly, of course, a restoration or transformation, yeah, to how to deal with the Beaux-Arts building. 
and you know you do we that if you go there because a lot of people go to New York. We did many many things already, but you will think, oh, it has always been like that. But we have been designing the desk, we've been designing exhibitions in it, and I should show you how it looked before because it looked horrible, but now it looks very logic. So I'm here on the roof of that building, but I also want to explain you the building across the street. What was a building from almost the same period? People think it was from the 80s. No, it was from the same Beaux-Arts period, maybe four or five years later. It used to be a department store. And what we did that we said, that is the sketch that we made, we want to link the two buildings in a logic way. You know, what program, what is the research library? There used to be a children library in the research library. And we said, that's not logic. We bring the children to this library and some of the collection of this building we brought it to that one. So we really went into the collection because libraries, I have to tell you, it's not about books, it's about collections and about sharing knowledge. So it's the, the, this is the Stavros Niarchs Foundation Library, how it was named. It used to be, as I told you, a um, department store, mechanical equipment, of course, on the roof, like in all buildings of New York, a basement with no daylight. And we made this building out of it. We had we made cuts in the building um, to make a um, the, what I call the the long room. We put a wizard head on top of it. We made two atriums to the to the uh, lower ground floor. The building had an enormous amount of columns. What to do with all these columns? And so we started. Okay, let's celebrate the columns. So what we did, you know, celebrate them. Like if you enter, we put up lights. We make a, a long uh, canopy. And, uh, and a red carpet, come in in the building, the desk is at the end, first solve your own things yourself. And what we also did is hang tables on the columns. You know, like the table, that's why I also like your table here. It's hanging on the columns, so we d that's why we used space in between the columns and not... Uh, uh, we made the uh, voids to a lower ground floor for the teenagers, and but also for the children department. We made these little things that the children can see if they throw away the book, not throw away, bring back the book, what that happens, how it's organized. Uh, we made uh, um, from three stories, we made five story of uh, stacking the books um, with a beautiful ceiling. So it's a reflection of the building with the stacks on the, on the other side of the, uh, of the, um, the, the central library, the research library, also creating new ceilings is a, is a theme over there. The stacks that we organize, but they are, um, again, reflecting the, the, the other library. But these ones in the other library, you can't use them. They, are used, they, they don't make sense, but here they make sense. Uh, the long tables that are hanging on the, on the columns, and we did design the chairs um, uh, of it uh, to create our own chairs, what is also happening in the research library, but these chairs are much more comfortable and uh, everybody can sit on it. Uh, it's reflecting uh, this, um, this building, uh, the Rosemain Reading Room, long tables, own chairs, special ceiling, you know, it's, so it's balancing the and bringing them together in a more modern way, but they really feel like they belong together. Reflecting the stacks, as I told you, in this building, we do it in a different way in that building. Looking to each other, that's important. Looking from this building to the other building on Fifth Avenue. Uh, on top of it, the wizard head. And here you can see very well that we did elevate the wizard head. It's inspired by all the special roofs on the other Bozar buildings. Uh, but also we did elevate it so you can overlook the parapet. Here you can see that, and then it's nice that you can sit on the edges and that you define, because that's more for conferences and this is really public. Here you see the inspiration from the other side and the public terrace, what is unique in Mid-Manhattan, that's for free. People uh, can jo enjoy it. The, what's happening in the conferences here underneath the Wizard Head. And also looking back on the, on the corner of 5th Avenue and 40th Street, enjoying the city and a new meeting point. So if you uh, need a meeting point in New York, meet here. Very important. Um, so here you see it, the roof, the entrance. Local, as you mentioned, I'm now finishing up, but it's just that we try to make in every building something new. Local was, was inspired by the uh, um, textile industry. We always try to make an interior also iconic as a home. 
And I think the next thing, what I'm extremely interested in is urban planning, very bad neighborhood in Rotterdam South, not connected, very poor people, um, not connected to well education or good jobs, to make a plan for them. And that's what I did with a lot of people making a plan, a new, giving a new perspective and talking in a positive way about these people who live in these neighborhoods um, and how we should work all together to solve the problem. So that's a little bit I should I tell me that I should finish, I should go home, otherwise I, I miss my plane. But just to tell you why we at Meccano made so many different buildings, they all look different because of people, place and purpose. So this is a little bit very short uh, philosophy of Meccano.